His Excellency Amit Naran, Ambassador of India to the Sultanate of Oman, Divya Ma'am, Spouse of His Excellency the Ambassador, Professor Sandhya Rao Mehta, Kiran Bhai, very good evening to one and all. At the outset, on behalf of Embassy of India, allow me to extend warm wishes to all the women present here a happy International Women's Day. Today holds a special significance in India as it coincides with Mahashivratri. On this auspicious occasion, I also extend heartfelt greetings for a joyous Mahashivratri celebration. It is my privilege to welcome you all this evening to the fifth lecture of our landmark series from Madhvi to Musket, Indian Community and the Shared History of India and Oman. As we commence today's event, I kindly invite Divya Ma'am, the spouse of His Excellency, the Ambassador, to address the gathering. Thank you, Anup. Can you hear me? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am proud to come from a country where the head of the state, our president, Draupadi Murmu, is a lady. And I am prouder because she is not our first one. As a nation, we not only accept women in power, we endeavor to empower all women and then go further to celebrate them. The ladies who work here, at the Embassy of India, Muscat, are truly remarkable, both Omani and Indian. They are consummate professionals and work just as hard, if not harder, than their male counterparts. On the occasion of the International Women's Day, please give them a big applause. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a very happy International Day to all of you too. I cannot chronicle all the success stories of Indian women because they are numerous and ever-growing, be it sports, science, academics, politics, business, homemaking or arts. Indian women are striving, shining and thriving and conquering every aspect of the workplace. Okay. So they are conquering every aspect of the workplace. And what about home? Is home suffering? No. We are grateful to the men in our lives and the mothers that raised them. That men have become just as adept on the home front as women have become on the workplace. We are grateful for the men in our lives, to have them as our allies, our dads, brothers, husbands, sons who educate and support us in our endeavors, both inside and outside the home. When I didn't know how to cook, it was my dear husband who patiently ate everything that I put on his plate. And it is because of him that my cooking went from bad to being average. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Since we are on that subject, let me thank His Excellency Mr. Ramit Narang for envisioning and providing a space for these lectures. I'll also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sandhya Rao Mehta for helping us thread together the Manvi to Muscat series. In particular, I'm grateful to her for highlighting the stories of the Manvi women today. These untold tales needed to be told. And thank you, Sandhya ji. I was talking about allies earlier, people who support us. And Oman is just such a culture. The Omani people, both men and women, embraced the Indian community and let them flourish. The Indian men were allowed to see contracts, open shops, and the women were free to wear their own garments, follow their own rituals, and preserve their own cultures. I salute His Majesty, the late Sultan Qaboos, who brought Oman into the modern era and made it a conducive place where both Indian and Omani ladies could pursue the, their own professions and their own passions. Currently, Oman is a peaceful haven for women. And thanks to His Majesty Sultan Hetam bin Tariq, who has ensured that the women and girls have equal access to quality education, health care, work opportunities, as well as political representation. Today, along with uh, Women's Day as a... Anup mentioned the Indian community is also celebrating Mahashivratri. Now for millennia we have worshipped Lord Shiv 
and for just as long we have revered lord shiva in his form or ardhanarishwar right simply translated <laughs> okay <laughs> yes yes we have revered lord shiva in the form of ardhanarishwar simply translated it just means that the lord is half woman but what it symbolizes what it signifies is that the totality lies beyond the duality the male and female energies are inseparable each is dependent on each other so we can talk in terms of men wear blue and women wear pink but a society or a nation's success depends on both men and women and on that note i'd like to thank everyone who worked hard to make this day a success especially the audience members who came despite the rain and despite the flash flood warnings thank you so much happy international women's day thank you ma'am today's lecture will be by dr sandhya rao mehta who will share her views on empowering narratives of women in the historical indian community in oman her presence here is not new to us she has been a steadfast pillar of support throughout the entirety of our lecture series dr sandhya rao mehta is an associate professor in the department of english language and literature at sultan qabus university she has a phd in literature of the indian diaspora and has subsequently focused on the indian community in oman in much of her research dr mehta was a visiting professor at york university canada and she has presented papers at oxford and cambridge universities among many others let's kindly welcome dr sandhya rao mehta to the stage for the lecture Um, good evening. Uh, can you all hear me and see me? I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just for a second, I will. Your Excellency Ambassador Amit Narang, Shrimati Divya Narang, colleagues, friends, uh, guests. Good evening and uh, uh, greetings on International Women's Day. Uh, thank you all for coming on a day like this, especially. um and uh, for sharing your evening with us i hope you do find this presentation uh, useful and uh, interesting so in commemoration of this occasion the presentation adds a distinct uh, perspective for the manvi musket uh, series so as some of us actually have been attending some of these uh, lectures uh, many of uh, you actually have been attending these lectures Uh, we have listened to the oman india story the mandvi musket story and in a broader way the arabian gulf india story uh, from many different perspectives we've heard it from the civilizational perspective we've also heard it in terms of trade we've also heard uh, about it from its role in uh, uh, in the wider gulf region what has been missing in this story of course and you would have guessed that of course are the women who are they where are they in this story what do they think what were they doing why are these stories never told why don't we get to know about the not so secret lives but why don't we know about them well this is an attempt to give their stories uh, a voice so uh i can step down actually from here uh, so just for a second i want to talk about uh, the title itself empowering uh, women and uh, i consider the idea both uh, i'm also a kind of a linguist as well so i will look at it in terms of uh, the grammar so empowering narratives is both uh, a verb that is we are empowering women by giving them a uh, 
opportunities by giving them a platform to speak, but also uh, is an adjective really, uh, the narratives are empowering. So just the, and that's part of what I am going to go on to talk about, that just the fact that uh, women get a chance to tell their story, just that we are interested enough to go to listen to people, uh, also to give them an idea that their story is important, that in its own way kind of empowers them. So that's uh, the idea behind uh, the, uh, the project as well. So I do have a little caveat over there. Uh, which is, uh, I'm sorry, but I haven't been able to cover all the families. It's going to be impossible. We need multiple sessions, multiple volumes uh, to cover each uh, family over here. So I do apologize if, uh, you know, if, I, if I haven't uh, met you or haven't had the chance. Hopefully this, uh, this is an ongoing project. Um, also, uh, the, the presentation is framed in both ways. Uh, it's academic to some extent, but a very little, small extent, so please don't be nervous. I'm not using a lot of technical language here. Um, it, the, um, the framing is academic uh, in terms of a little bit of feminist studies, uh, but uh, not so much. So hopefully you will uh, enjoy, because these are your stories, really. And I've had the privilege of uh, meeting some of you. So just a quick uh, outline uh, of uh, the presentation itself. Um, so I, we can begin by talking about why these stories. So a little bit about feminist historiography. How is history written? Uh, from whose point of view uh, do we write uh, history? We go on then to talk about examples of uh, women's narratives in generally the diaspora, not necessarily in Oman, not necessarily Indian women uh, in Oman. And there, I just want to introduce you to the idea of oral history projects, uh, which are very popular. Actually, this is not particularly unique anymore. They are very popular. We'll look at a couple of examples there. And then we'll move on to some prehistoric evidence that may be there, um, archaeological artifacts. And I know historians will disagree with me, but uh, let's see how we go. I've divided the women uh, into uh, three parts. Uh, uh, it doesn't really mean uh, much else, because I know we can read uh, a lot into that. But the pioneers, the pioneers are uh, women uh, who uh, came here in the early part of the uh, 20th century. Uh, some of you, uh, I've, I've been privileged to listen to some of your stories. And uh, I'm hopefully going to convey some of them to you. The settlers. Uh, who I call the settlers are people who came in, women who came uh, between 1970 and 2000. And uh, we will talk about uh, their life stories. And then uh, people, of course, after 2000, who I call entrepreneurs, although all these people have been entrepreneurs in their own way uh, as well, because they have all, uh, against all odds, many times started out very, very successful businesses, and families have supported them uh, also. So. Why do histories matter? And why do women's histories matter? Well, they matter because of exactly that. Histories are his stories. They are stories which have traditionally been told about men, for men, by men, about men. They're about wars. They're about commanders and soldiers. And you know, we've all done our histories in schools, at least. Those of you who didn't like history very much probably stopped at that point. Uh, but at whatever level, history is very much uh, a male perspective, uh, has been, not anymore, but uh, traditionally has been. So uh, we do talk about the fact that uh, there, in intersectional feminism, of course, we do accept that it's not histories, of course, it do, does have to be her stories. Uh, but also, uh, as uh, Kimberly Crenshaw says, all in inequalities are not equal. Uh, we can talk about different, even within women, there are inequalities in terms of opportunities, in terms of education. In India, we talk about uh, caste, for example. So, you know, people are not equal as each other, but unequal, uh, you know, in respect to each other. So, therefore, we have feminist historiography. I'm just reading out a little bit here, a little bit of theory, just one or two slides uh, on theory here. Uh, so research on women's issues has gradually evolved into research that problematizes gender. That is that we think and rethink about gender, allowing for a more nuanced understanding of systemic marginalization through forces of domination, such as patriarchy, uh, colonialism, casteism, and racism. You can add many other race, uh, isms to that uh, as well. But the idea, of course, is uh, that uh, when you're telling a story uh, 
with a woman, uh, as at the center of the story, there are various different marginalizations that we need to consider. When it comes to actually um, the, uh, the methodology, in a way, uh, Mavani and Mukaddam, who've actually worked on the Gujarati diaspora, in fact, they've said that uh, research by females is fundamentally different from mainstream research in terms of data collection, the nature of the questions which are asked, the challenges and limitations, if any, of research conducted by females because women ask and are asked different questions. So when we are telling a story, uh, a historical uh, narrative, um, the kind of stories that uh, we, we uh, get from women uh, are fundamentally different according to research because the kind of questions that are asked are essentially different as well, uh, very often. Um, feminist historiography is not uh, uncommon in India at all. Uh, so in the last, I would say in the last 30, 40 years, of course, it's taken on uh, a life of its own. And so you do have, we are all familiar, I think, with some of these names here, exploring the lives of Savitri Fule and uh, Tarabai Shinde. Both of them were uh, activists, educationists. And so uh, looking back at their stories, you know, looking back at uh, people who had not been at the center of, let's say, our textbooks, clearly, uh, that is part of uh, the, these kind of projects. How do we document and archive uh, women's history then? Very simply, oral history projects. Um, part of the idea of all this is because very little archival uh, public records exist of women's lives. Uh, and so oral history projects become the way in which to access those life histories, those life stories. So I'm just reading out uh, a quotation here, and Hua, who makes the point that diasporic women's practices, in fact, so, you know, many of us are diaspora, uh, members of the diaspora here, um, practices of remembering and documenting memories enable women not only to recreate the past, but also accept the importance of that story in the meta-narratives of history that is, in short, it empowers them. Knowing that their story is important or automatically empowers them because nobody really thinks that this was worth talking about. And so when somebody goes to ask those questions, uh, what did you think, what did you feel, how did you come, uh, you know, even within the space of uh, the four walls of your house, what were, what were the strategies? Uh, we don't use the word strategy, obviously, but how did you uh, manage your relationships? How did you manage uh, your, uh, the, the outside world? Uh, we all know that in its own way, women have power uh, within uh, their own houses, uh, which is not publicly acknowledged. Uh, so things like that, those kind of things come out very much in conversations and oral history projects. Uh, therefore, oral history is actually a technique for generating and preserving original, historically interesting information, which is basically primary sources uh, from personal recollections, that is from memory, through planned recorded interviews, researching a background, documenting, and archiving wherever it is possible. Sometimes it isn't, because if you have secondhand information, if somebody's saying, well, you know, my uh, or ancestors said that, or I remember somebody saying it, that's not, you know, one can't really prove that and can't really be established. Uh, but uh, if this is further uh, kind of triangulated with some other data, then this kind of information can be very, uh, very useful and uh, authentic. So it is basically a tool to preserve voices, memories, and perspectives of generations who have not been otherwise documented. Um, these are some examples of oral history projects. All, all of these are actually from uh, India. Uh, you may be familiar, anyone interested may be familiar with some of these projects as well. Dastan is a very famous uh, oral history project. Most of them have to do with partition, actually. A lot of these uh, are a um, uh, collection of, uh, again, uh, interviews, recordings, uh, uh, life experiences of uh, women. Uh, not all of them are about women, but specifically also of women who, uh, were, uh, who suffered during partition. And the idea just now is that a lot of these uh, people, women and, and men, uh, because they're not uh, going to be around for very long, there's, there's an urgency right now about capturing those voices uh, before they're lost. In fact, uh, Dastan, for example, also has a 3D 
um, kind of an arrangement where they show people in India, for example, the land uh, you know, in Karachi or Lahore or Islamabad, wherever they came from, they have volunteers there, and they show them 3D pictures of, you know, this is, your, this is where your house used to be. And so there are people who, you know, get, who get to see their ancestral uh, land. So it's, most of it is voluntary. But uh, yeah, so this is uh, uh, a little bit of what uh, I'm trying to do in this project as well. So oral narratives of Indian women in Oman. And when I say Indian women uh, in this context here, uh, I do mean specifically because in keeping with this series, we are talking about women from the Kachmandwi uh, area. Uh, and so it is limited in that way. We are not talking about, uh, there are many other uh, communities, of course, maybe not so in such large numbers, but uh, so we're not covering them. So we we'll leave that for another time. So the methods employed in this research include similar documentation as the one I had just showed you before of oral stories backed with evidence in the form of photographs, public documents if there are any, recordings of anecdotes, short stories, travel narratives, and memories of significant women. To the extent possible, this is also corroborated by other people's rendition of the times. Again, just to, uh, and, and there are many because all the memories actually, and all, a lot of the stories are similar. Uh, taken together, we get a comprehensive picture of the lives of the Kachi Gujarati women in Oman across a period of hundreds of years. But before that, let's go back even further. If you thought hundreds of years was long enough, Prehistoric evidence. Is there any prehistoric evidence? Can we say, for example, that uh, there is any evidence of the presence of, uh, of women? Uh, again, Indian women, and we all know that there's a Harappa connection to, uh, to ancient Oman. Uh, so these are pictures from the National Museum. Uh, there's, uh, there's a carnelian uh, string of beads. Uh, there, uh, there are singular beads. There's a jar. So my question when I uh, thought about this was, does it suggest the presence of women in prehistoric times? Of course, I mean, nobody will know. I reached out to some archaeologists. Uh, I reached out to Daniel Potts, who's an uh, archaeologist at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. And this was his reply. He said, we have really so few artifacts, and while some scholars might assume that seals, weights, and pottery show male associations, and perhaps combs and carnelian beads show female ones, I think this is highly speculative. So possibly not, uh, but no harm in trying. So there we are. However, Dr. Chaya Goswami, who uh, did deliver a lecture a, a month or two ago over here, I reached out to her as well. And she said, well, beads could represent the feminine side of material culture, even if not conclusively. So there we go. We just will not know. But isn't it interesting to know that there must have been so many women from Harappa uh, in, uh, you know, along the coast uh, of Sur or, 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 the, or the interiors where so much uh, uh, digging is going on even now, actually, in Oman. There is documentary evidence, however. And so we move uh, from the prehistoric period, we move, uh, sorry, this is quite dense, but this is almost uh, 300 years, uh, all encapsulated in one slide over here. Uh, so there is a little bit of documentary evidence. So let's go over what kind of evidence there is uh, from the history books. What has history told us about uh, Indians in, in, uh, in general? And maybe we can look for signs of the women here. So um, I hope you can see this. Uh, 1750 to 1950, the 200 years uh, over here. Um, so between, so even if you can't, I'm just reading it out anyway. So between 1750s and the 1950s, the Indian presence in Oman, mainly Muscat and neighboring Matra, was the largest in the entire Gulf uh, region. So this is historically unknown. In 1765, which is within this period, historian Nilbor visited Muscat in 1765 and says, in no other Mohammedan city are the Indians so numerous as in Muscat. 
their numbers in their city amounts to no fewer than 1,200. They are permitted to live agreeably to their own laws, to bring wives hither, to set up idols in their chambers, and to burn their dead. In the 1800s, by the early 1820s, it was thought that the Banyan communities in Muscat was about 2,000, which was really 6% of the entire population uh, in that region. I don't think it was the country, but in that region. By 1835, we have Lieutenant Wellstead of the Indian Navy who visited Oman and observed that there were about 1,500 Banyas in Muscat, remarking that this was the largest Indian presence in Arabia. And the, by the early 1900s, there is a lot of historical uh, work on it. Uh, British documents suggest that 250 merchants with dependents, so the, 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 the number is more, it's 250 uh, merchants themselves with their dependents lived in Mathra and Muscat, making it around 1,500 Kachi Bhatias. So that's a continuous presence, uh, as we can see, over uh, the last uh, 200 years documented and about three to 400 years even sporadically um, evidenced as well. I was trying to think of what the, uh, these markets, these bustling markets that we just read out, what they would look like. This was of a period much later on, but I, but I imagine the market to be something like this. Uh, this is a lot of my collection, of course, and I will acknowledge uh, uh, Vimal Puricha uh, later on, but a lot of the, uh, the very, very beautiful photographs that we will uh, see are all uh, from his private collection. Uh, but uh, yes, it's a bustling market. 200 years ago, this is what Muscat or Mathra would have been like. It's bustling, uh, different kinds of people. It's not unimaginable at all that there would have been uh, men and women, uh, you know, just, just kind of... Uh, uh, buying vegetables. More specific uh, evidence, if you like to call it that. In a story that many of us know, uh, whether you've uh, attended some of our lectures, uh, or if you have any uh, kind of scam passing uh, knowledge of history, uh, of Oman that is, um, or you know, for anyone else who doesn't, let me just give you this story here. Um, uh, th this has been uh, sourced from multiple sources, so a lot of people know about this story, but I'm just quoting John Peterson here. So the Muscati historian Ibn Razaik offers the dramatic story of the downfall of Muscat as a result of the Portuguese commandant Pereira, who demanded to marry the daughter of an Indian merchant named Narottam. As his only way out, Narottam convinced the commandant to empty the fort's water and food supplies ultimately expelling the Portuguese. This is a very famous story. Many of us know this. It's been taken as, uh, um, as uh, a kind of a sign of, uh, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Indian Narottam, the trader, Indian trader Narottam's kind of cleverness, uh, his, um, his, his kind of uh, presence of mind. Uh, but of course, he was really angry, apparently, that uh, the Portuguese commander wanted to marry his daughter. All I could think, and I've been hearing this story for more than 10 years, all I can think every time people tell me the story is, who was the woman? Who was she? Was she so beautiful? What happened to her? Did she end up here? Did she go back? Did she marry? We'll never know. But that's so sad, so sad that an entire empire has been saved and another one destroyed, all because of a woman whose story we will never know. James Only, some of you have heard him uh, when he came uh, the last time here, he says the presence of Hindu women in the lower gulf is a startling find, for it contrasts sharply with common observations which conclude that Hindu merchants rarely took their wives and daughters with them overseas. And yet, they did come. Or against all odds of history, it looks like. What are their stories? So we can start with uh, the, 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 the,
क्या क्या होता था कि मैं कैसे जाऊं क्या करूं कैसा मेरा टाइम निकलेगा और सब नया नया ना मेरा भी शादी हुआ था बीस पच्चीस दिन भी हुआ था तो मेरा हस्बैंड के साथ भी इतना नहीं रिश्ता था ना तो वो सब मेरे को इंडिया में भी मेरा सब जो जो था वो सब मेरे को छोड़ने को आया था और तब मैं ऊपर चढ़ी तो तब उधर मुंबई में तो क्या था तो सिप में नहीं था वो सीधा सीढ़ी लगाता था वो सीढ़ी के आके ऊपर हम लोग गया लेकिन क्या मेरा हस्बैंड इधर सर्विस करता था तो हम लोग को तो केबिन था और बिजनेस क्लास था तो केबिन था लेकिन अच्छा था केबिन भी और वो और जो सामान जो लगे था वो सब अलग वो लोग ले लेता था इसलिए दो दो ऊपर नीचे बेड था और बाथरूम और नहीं था खाली वॉश मशीन था और कितने दिन लगे थे आपको और चार दिन चार दिन में हाँ, आपको पहली बार आई तो सिर्फ तो मैंने पहले देखा ही नहीं था तो मेरे को मालूम नहीं क्या क्या थैंक यू राइट दिस वाज सपोज टू अबिन अलिल मोर आई वाज सपोज टू बिल्ड अप टू दैट बट दैट्स फाइन सो दिस इज द दिस इज द रूट दैट एवरीवन टुक बिफोर 1970 so uh, i the stories are based on you know whatever i've heard uh, so people would come to bombay from uh, from mandvi uh, and uh, would go to in a in a in, in a ship in a yeah in a uh, in a ferry in a ship actually a steamer actually uh, through karachi gwadar uh, and uh, then to uh, over to muscat and almost everyone has told me that the journey took uh, four nights and uh, five days so um it doesn't feel that uh that long uh but but also it's not that far as you can see uh here uh as well uh and uh, the conditions at that point didn't seem to be uh very very difficult but they were still as you can see from this so this is a conversation of course that i had uh, with uh, pushpa ji and uh, just for anyone who you know who couldn't understand uh the the hindi um there Uh, she was just saying well i i really i just translated it there for you anyway i really didn't didn't know where i was going i was 21 years old i had no idea uh, i i was just married i my husband was new to me i so everything was new we had to climb the stairs i think something i'm imagining like a kind of a you know a very uh, rough kind of ladder uh, climbing up like that is it and uh, our luggage was taken away from us but at least we were in business class so there were but there were others below deck i'm thinking of a little bit like the titanic but uh, munir ji uh, think agrees uh, and the journey took four nights and uh, five days so this is how uh, this is how they came um asha ji uh, also uh, corroborated the story and her story goes i was born in uh, 1938 in india uh, this is her by the way on uh, the uh, on the uh, uh the everest uh, yeah the base camp the base camp of the everest very recently by the way so very inspirational so i was born in 1938 in india because my mother went to mandvi from zanzibar for delivery she took me back to zanzibar and i came to muscat uh, one year later in fact my father only saw me when i was uh, one year old because she seems you know she went all the way back to zanzibar and then came back home uh, finally Later on Asha ji actually came back to Oman after her marriage in 1961 because she went away to study and then uh, came back following her marriage and soon after that she went to Salala uh, and uh, with her husband and although there was little company she told me although there was very little company in Salala which is uh, you know it was at that time Muscat already was uh, you know fairly tough life Salala was obviously tougher the family at that time developed lasting relations with uh, members of the royal family we will hear more from Asha ji later on uh Shrimati Jawhar bhai uh of course uh, a lot of these records are coming from uh, Mr Vimal Purecha to whom I'm eternally grateful uh their family uh, the Ratan Si Purushottam family has are the best historians uh in oman anything you want to know about uh, uh life in oman indians in oman the last 3 400 years he is your number one source uh for and and all of these photographs are his uh, from his collection i mean not only um is he an avid uh, archivist and his family as well 
uh, he, um, his family has had a very interesting uh, background, and uh, uh, particularly also, if everything wasn't enough, even the female side of his story is very, very interesting as well. And so we have here uh, his grandmother. So in the Ratan Sipurishotan family, uh, Lalji, who was his, uh, uh, um, Vimalji's grandfather, uh, passed away suddenly in 1932. His wife, Jabarbai Lalji, had to make the urgent decision to return to Muscat from Karachi, where she was with her minor son, who was only 12 years old. Against all odds, as a woman unused to be in public, that's not surprising at all, she had to put the firm back together because uh, her husband died unexpectedly and uh, they had uh, businesses in the entire country, in the interiors and in the coastal area, etc. She had to come back and uh, uh, be the one person to put all the documents together, including looking over the paperwork, manage multiple properties which they had at that time, and also consolidate the accounts of money, which was also owed to them possibly uh, because of the business dealings that they were doing. There was uh, sometimes uh, next to no paperwork at all, but she had to follow up all of that, and, uh, so, and, and she did. She managed to do all of this uh, and uh, retrieved, apparently retrieved a lot of the family fortunes uh, that uh, could have got lost had not she taken, uh, you know, uh, uh, action immediately. All that while taking care of a minor child. It couldn't have been easy, but she did this. All along, while we are talking about all of this, of course, we are talking about the Oman-India connection. We are talking about uh, all the way in which uh, women also in their own ways uh, are making these connections with Omani public life as well, as you can see here. So these relationships that even women are forging unofficially at times with, the, uh, with Omani commercial interests, um, indirectly many, of, many times, uh, is, uh, you know, continues till today, as I will hopefully show. Shantadevi Toprani, uh, Muriji is uh, here as well. Again, very, very grateful to uh, all the help that he has always given me for these projects. Uh, born in 1914 in Lati, Gujarat, Shanta Narandas Toprani came to Muscat in 1933 following her marriage with uh, very little Gujarati and basic maths. Shanta Devi soon learned about the family business and by 1940 she was looking over all the bookkeeping and documentation of the NP uh, Toprani uh, company. From 1961, Shanta Devi was made the legal proprietor, and following the death of her husband Narendas in 1964, she became the sole owner of the family assets. In 2008, she was the oldest woman of the Gujarati community to be granted Omani citizenship at 93 years. She then unfortunately passed away in 2018. In fact, uh, as you can see over there, there is still a family business which runs in her name. So this is very recent photograph. Bhanu Ben is here as well. Uh, Bhanu Ben, born in 1938, came to Oman in 1959 at 21. Born in Manvi, she was brought up in Bombay after shifting from Karachi in the partition years. She graduated apparently along with Asha Khimjiji. They were uh, batchmates together uh, in college. She wanted to share her knowledge with others in the community. As the Mahajan school started, Bhanu Ben offered her cl classes at home because she was educated. She came with a college degree, which was quite rare at that time. Uh, she, in fact, also uh, offered uh, classes at home, graded, and also set exams for uh, children of the Mahajan school. Eventually, when the Indian Council heard about her, uh, he asked her to help her with the consulate papers which were brought home to her because she wasn't allowed to, uh, to go to the office and so a lot of the paperwork was brought to her. Her contributions to the community are well admired and recognized as she stayed busy helping everyone in the community and everybody in need. In fact, I was told uh, that she well, is one of the stalwarts of uh, the community, has been for a very long time. She's very active in the temple and even recreates original bhajans for specific occasions. So what I'm showing you before it plays, what I'm showing you next here uh, is a bhajan that uh, Bhanu, uh, Bhanu ben, uh, uh, recorded for us. She's here uh, today. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, and what is most interesting uh, is that this uh, bhajan, it's a prayer, a bhajan is, uh, is a prayer. 
uh, is, or a devotional song, I guess. Um, if you listen carefully to the first line, uh, it actually begins by saying, come all of you from Muscat, you know, come to, to pray to Govind Rai Ji. And, uh, and I, I thought that this, and these are original bhajans that were written uh, by her and her team of people, her friends. Uh, so I thought this was very, very inventive, you know, to bring in the idea of Muscat into the, into the bhajan. It's not a traditional bhajan, but it's actually, you know, you can see the synthesis of uh, Oman in India again. So can we have the bhajan, please? Sakhi jalo shujai maskat gaam maai Shri Gurindaraya ji miraj lila larma ju Gurindaraya ji miraj lila larma ju Pahila darshan tu mangala na manahari Shimara nathani मैंने नीर क्या जो गुंदराई जी राज लीला लहरमा के बीजा दर्शन सिंह शंकर वाले बहुत तुम्हारा नाथन श्री लक्ष्मी जी बराजराई जी राज लीला लहरमा त्रिजा दर्शन के बाल बाल भोगना मुखी मोर लिने छड़ी लिदि छेल माजो गोविंद राय राज लीला लहर मे चौथा दर्शन राज भो थैंक यू सॉरी so, um, so, so just uh, all of that actually, again, for those of you who didn't understand the song, the song is composed, uh, it, it's basically a devotional song asking devotees to come, uh, to gather together and to, uh, in, in, uh, in prayer to uh, Govind Rai Ji, basically, um, Shri Krishna. This I thought was a fantastic picture when we talk about women in public life uh, and uh, uh, it's self-explanatory. Uh, these are uh, Indian women. Uh, I, I know that you can't read the bottom. I'll read it out for you here. But it, what a wonderful syncretic uh, picture this is of uh, uh, women marching in celebration. This is in 1947, 15th August. Uh, this is uh, all uh, the women have come out to celebrate Independence Day. You can see the fort at the back. It's a, such a typical musket setting. And what obviously is so much more interesting is all the women. Uh, they've come out with their babies. There are children there uh, and uh, the national flag. Uh, what a wonderful uh, participation uh, of, the, uh, of uh, women uh, in this public occasion. So I'll just read it out actually here. Uh, this is an excerpt from the political diaries of the Persian Gulf. This is the British political diaries. Um, and I'll read it out because it is so interesting here. The merchant community in Muscat and Matra celebrated the Indian Independence Day on August 15th with considerable eclat. There were prayer meetings in the morning and firework display was held in the evening at Matra. Mr. Jamnadas Khimji of the firm Khimji Randas held a party in honor of the day of, at the consulate club, which was attended by Sir Shihab, the, universe, the Sultanate representative, the political agent, and senior officials of the Muscat government. So this is how 1947, 15th August, was uh, celebrated. And uh, you know what a lovely picture. Maybe we can, do you recognize her there? Oh, yay, wonderful, wonderful. So from the public, we move on to uh, everyday practices. Uh, in in um, data collection, everyday practices are very uh, as important as public uh, life. Uh, because for women, what they're doing uh, other than kind of businesses and uh, uh, in processions, uh, what they do uh, the rest of the time is almost as important and gives us such an insight into the, the, the way the world was, how daily life was um, now almost 100 years ago, really, almost 90 years ago. So 
Um, so life was tough in those early days, but all the respondents that I spoke to spoke about the tremendous community help they got from each other, actually, and from others who lived in Muscat and Matra. They, are, they, are, they all came, some, some of them said that they came uh, without knowing uh, who else was there, but once they came here, they found people from their own, like, baradari in a way. And even if they didn't, they were supported. It was this very um, close group of uh, women, specifically, who supported each other. It was also intensely hot, and many reminisce about going up to the terrace to escape the heat in the night. Here is Pushpa Ben narrating the details of the bhunga, a canopy made of date palm fronds, uh, to protect themselves from uh, the heat. This is on the terrace, and this is a little translation of that, but we can listen to Pushpavan herself. What? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> क्या बोलते हैं खजूरी का बेच का जो बांध है ना वो सूख जाता है ना वो बांध के इतना अच्छा सरस बनाता था और हम लोग रात को ऊपर इसके अंदर सोने वो पंखा लेके जाता था तो रात को पंखा लेके सो जाता था ऐसा ही अने जब भी छोटा बच्चा होता है कि बल बालक होता है तो क्या उसको वो उसको गोड़िया में सुलाता है और एक पानी में और एक चादर पानी में डालकर वो गीला करता है और ऊपर डाल देता है लू में तो उसको क्या ठंडक ज्यादा गर्मी नहीं लगता है और ज्यादा हवा भी नहीं आता है और रात को भी इतना गर्मी होता है ना तो उसको रात को पहले सो जाता था फिर हम उठते थे दो तीन बजे और उसको पानी पिलाता था क्योंकि इतना लू है गर्म हवा है तो गला सूख जाता है ना तो हम लोग भी पानी पीता है लेकिन बच्चे को लाजम पिलाता है पानी <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who didn't understand that, I mean, I did try to translate a little bit over there. Uh, the, the, the khajur ke, I think uh, some of you can explain that better than I can probably, but uh, khajur ke, the dry palm, right, and they're making little canopies. Actually, it's even more interesting than that because when I was asking them more, uh, they were saying, well, you know, because all the terraces, I'll show you another picture here, but all the terraces were interlocked, interlinked like that. And so all the palm fronds were like, as if it's also like a little room. You know, this is our family, right? Like, so, so there would be a little bit of a canopy like that uh, to separate them from the other family because they're all actually just, uh, just together. They're all lying down together. They're all uh, sleeping together. The babies are, uh, are, are there. In fact, uh, Miruji, I think, told me that uh, one baby actually fell down because the terrace, uh, you know, the, the terrace height was not very, very, uh, the walls of the terrace were not very high. Uh, so yeah, it did sound a little dangerous, but apparently the, it wasn't very, like, anyway, the, the terrace itself wasn't very high, so she, you know, he or she didn't fall uh, very deep. Uh, so these are the terraces that we're talking about. A little bit of uh, snippets of uh, Muscat and Matra uh, at the time. So we can imagine uh, these roofs uh, all uh, linked together. Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, I'm sure you all can recognize this. Uh, this is uh, the, the Cornish now and Surlavatia from uh, the sea, the view from the sea. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, Beit Ratansi, uh, the, the big family home of uh, the Ratansi Purushottam family. So yeah, this is an aerial view. Gives us a really good uh, um, uh, image of uh, women's lives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you can keep this in mind as we go on as well. So of child and childbirth, most women spoke about the special card that they needed. Uh, and why I have this here is because you can see the wall of uh, uh, the, the city, I guess, uh, here. And so the, the walls uh, were, uh, the gates would be closed uh, at night only to be open in the morning. Uh, so women spoke about, you know, preg when they were pregnant, that they would have to take a special card, uh, which was a permission card, to go to the hospital, which was outside the gate. And so, uh, because you know, one, they wouldn't know when exactly they, need, they would need to go to the hospital, they would actually take uh, this uh, special permission from the Wali, and uh, those would be usually valid for about 15 days. 
just in case delivery happened unexpectedly, but uh, sometimes that didn't, wasn't even possible, and many babies were also born uh, at home. Most families sent their children back to India after primary school to ensure higher education, and in fact, a lot of women that I did speak uh, to spoke of the sacrifice uh, that uh, they had to make to send their children, who were very, very young those days. Uh, a lot of them sent their children away uh, when they were just about uh, seven, eight years old, uh, so that they could be educated. Uh, most of them, of course, uh, went back to Bombay. More everyday practices. There were very few seasonal vegetables. So local green leaves, which are, forgive me, I may be pronouncing them wrong, wrong but uh, loni bhaji, uh, raw date, which is khajur uh, ki sabzi, curry of uh, raw dates, which is vritap, uh, and lime pickle were all very popular uh, dishes because that they, they, you know, the women worked with whatever was available uh, locally. Um, this uh, was such a fascinating piece of information. Pebbles were used to make the curry. Uh, those of you who make curry, which is a chickpea, chickpea flour dish, uh, has pakoras. You, everyone knows pakoras. Uh, so uh, they would use small pebbles actually uh, to you know, dip that into the chickpea to make pakoras out of it, basically to get the shape and then uh, take them out because there was really nothing to put into the pakoras. And the small stones were also used to form the pakoras, add texture, sometimes even a vegetable, a sabzi would be made with all these pebbles as well, but yes, thrown out later, of course. Uh, local produce included chilies, pomegranates and uh, dates. Uh, more commonly. And sorry, this is uh, again uh, a beautiful picture uh, of uh, uh, Vimalji's uh, mother and grandmother, Javar Bhai and Ma uh, Madhri Bhai, buying vegetables uh, from an Omani vendor uh, in 1967. So. Milk was available very, very sparsely to those who owned cows. This was usually shared among the community. Asha Khimjiji, in fact, told me that her family had a gaushala of uh, eight cows. Uh, and everybody else also told me that uh, uh, they all had possibly a cow uh, or two, depending on how much space they had uh, you know, to, to keep them uh, as well. Water was brought from the Govind Rai temple in mud pots, which were wrapped in jute uh, by domestic help. This is uh, from the temple, um, the, the Shiv temple that we all know. And this water was also used to cook. While men went to the temple to wash up, followed by the children, women would wait for this, that, that well water, the sweet water, to cook and, uh, and to bathe as well. Scarcity of water meant that it was used very, very wisely and uh, carefully. I think there is a lesson in that for all of us. But I also, uh, again, I think uh, Niruji did say, we didn't even bother mopping. There was so little water, we had to be so careful. So we rarely mopped the floor. It was basically just brooming because we had to be so careful with the water that was used. There was always a wait for months for a new steamer to come with supplies and letters from home. You talk about women. Remember, these are women who have left their families uh, not in touch with them for months together. So many of them uh, would write home to their possibly uh, mothers who could read and write, but most often not. So basically, uh, sometimes uh, brothers who would write on uh, behalf of the mothers. The Panchang, which is the Indian calendar, was also would be sent by family members so that they would get to know, you know the important dates and all of that. A little bit more of that a bit later on. This is fascinatingly a letter posted in 1931, believe it or not, uh, which again, uh, guess who? Uh, in fact, Nanaji actually showed me this letter the, uh, uh, the last time I met her. And uh, this was uh, sent uh, on the 17th of November, uh, 1931, reached on the 21st of November, 1931. So uh, five days, uh, fantastic postal service. And we can get uh, Vimalji actually to read it out. Uh, it, the, the address is just in general. Uh, I think Ratansi uh, uh, house, and uh, it, somebody else has written musket at the bottom. Uh, so yes, but, and yet the letter reached. So fantastic postal service on both fronts. Um, entertainment. What did women do other than everything that they normally do? Well, uh, I, uh, vignettes of uh, weekend life, if we can call it that. 
uh, women on a picnic in the Sadat Beach. Uh, the, um, they're going in this, uh, what I call the hoodie. Uh, I hope I pronounced that again. I've, I've practiced it a couple of times now. But uh, the fishing boat, uh, which would be cleaned, Vimalji told me uh, they would clean up a boat like that multiple times with salt water so that the smell of the fish would go away because the women had to, you know, they were going to go uh, picnicking uh, in that and, uh, you know, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't like it. Uh, so this is uh, a family outing. This is part of the family outing uh, for them. And, of course, this is uh, a family picnic uh, with uh, Vimalji's uh, uh, family. Uh, in fact, in this, uh, I remember Asha ji also telling me uh, a story of them going to, uh, to uh, Seep, where they had farmhouses, when they had, where they had a farmhouse uh, in Seep, and uh, how they would go in a Land Rover, and uh, they would uh, look at the panchang, look at the moon, you know, to figure out the tide, and the low tide, and the high tide, because you would have to go in the low tide, you can't travel in the high tide, because you're, you're, you know, you're driving through, the, through the, what we now call the beach. Uh, and uh, they would have to deflate the tires uh, to make sure that it was, you know, travel worthy. The, the Land Rover was also travel worthy and that it would take them, I think she told me, about eight hours uh, to reach. So, no, you couldn't just do it over the weekend. It had to be a long planned out Eid trip to go all the way to um, Seed. Is also here? Yes, Shantiman. Ah, okay, over here, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I feel so odd, you know, telling your stories, but uh, yes. So without electricity, men came back home by 7 p.m. because uh, that's it, the day was done. Uh, many of them would go for a walk at times with their families along the stream, uh, men, uh, women would go to each other's homes, sit on mats, which are the chatais, uh, cool themselves with lemon drinks, as lemons were plentiful. Lots of lemons going on, actually. Every time I heard people, they would say, uh, lemonade, basically, because it was easily available. It was more easily available than anything else. So basically, what we call sharbat, uh, lemon. Just uh, as, as we earlier heard also, Pushpa Ben also saying, you know, even Bachonko, like even to the kids, they would constantly, because they would be dehydrated otherwise, so constantly lemon water. Uh, these are some uh, festive clothes that women had, uh, um, that women wore on festive occasions. And of course, this is a photograph of uh, Vimalji's uh, mother in um, tending to, uh, doing a little bit of gardening, uh, tending to some plants. At this point, I just want to spend a moment uh, acknowledging uh, Srimadhi Ratanben. In fact, uh, Niruji had just pointed her out and Vijay Singhba who were both interviewed uh, when I first started this project. This was in uh, 2013. And when I first, for the first, uh, one of the first articles that I wrote, I had interviewed uh, both of them. And uh, they, uh, the, uh, the stories about the stones and the pebbles actually first came from Ratan Ben herself. And uh, although they, uh, both of them are not uh, around anymore, uh, I, do, uh, I do owe them a lot in, uh, in terms of just getting me to begin to, uh, you know, listen to these stories and uh, I'm so grateful to them. So Ratan Ben, in fact, had spoken about being connected through the terraces, the making the papad, uh, you know, up there on the terrace, and they're making papas, singing devotional songs, going to see on a Land Rover, although the Eid holidays, and waiting for letters from her brothers with news from uh, home. This, uh, I heard about these stories first, actually, in 2013 from Ratan Ben herself. Um, faith, of course, is very important to all communities, as they are to, the, uh, to uh, all Indian communities, of course, but specifically also to the Manvi Kutch uh, families here. Uh, here we have, uh, in fact, uh, Calvin Allen, some of you do know him. Calvin Allen suggests that there were more than six temples in the Muscat area. Over time, only two, of course, remain today. Women remain the custodians of prayers, rituals, festivals, offerings, prasad, bringing continuity and a belonging to uh, the adopted land. So here we have uh, the, uh, the very old temple, which probably doesn't exist now, which is the Kali Mandir uh, near Riyam. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Shiv Mandir and uh, the, uh, the Krishna temple at Darsid. 
And uh, the, the in Bhutan, it isn't the Kali Temple. The yes, Gupta Mata. That's what you told me also. Yes, and this is the original nameplate of the Mopeshwar Mahadev Temple, uh, which was uh, renovated and by Gopal Tulalji Hirojani, and uh, Hira lives here today. So uh, that's her family there. So we move on uh, from all those women who were here all those years ago and their stories. We here have the, the what we can call the settlers. Uh, the story is quicker now. Uh, so between 1970 and 2000, women came in larger numbers to join the increasing number of traders, but the heritage families didn't really increase considerably. Uh, the numbers don't really go up. As the new generations took over, their narrative accounts were an extension of their elders, but actually also different in many ways, also because the country uh, was also changing. So obviously what women were doing uh, was also changing. They're recreating homes, but also looking forward to living and working in a dynamically changing context. So I just want to spend a little moment be back, be, to go back to a little bit of theory there to talk about how we can understand women uh, of this generation, the last uh, 30, 40 years. Alison Blunt and Majumdar also, they talk about how nostalgia, memory, and identity are all recreated through homemaking strategies. So what exactly is homemaking? This includes recreating images of home in new spaces, using public private spaces, and you, we can think about like apartment corridors, for example, which you know where we sometimes uh, have rangolis, uh, or even setting up temporary temples uh, in one's uh, kind of informal place. It could be like outside a villa, for example, as well, uh, to observe festivals and auspicious events. So this is a strategic way in which belonging can be uh, established, not through official channels, not officially through temples, uh, but in other ways uh, which are you know, closer to home. And this, I think, is an uh, interesting uh, photograph which brings out all of that. As, as you can all see, it's a Navratri movement. But what I like about this is how you can see, of course, uh, this is Sultan Qaboos, uh, you know, kind of almost kind of, you know, engaging uh, with this Navratri movement. Uh, so there is so much, uh, you know, synergy, the Indo-Oman synergy, a public space, kind of private public, because these are, uh, you know, these are not, they're not dancing on the streets, but they would in India, for example, but this is an allocated uh, place where this is permitted, permissions are, you know, proper permissions are given, but, uh, uh, yes, I mean, there's, uh, you know, the Sultan's blessing everybody from up there. Some women, notable women from notable families uh, who came. So these are some descriptions of them. Radhila uh, Pawani, who came to Muscat in 1970, and I was told that she was one of the first people who actually came in 1970 by air and not uh, the ferries that we had seen earlier, not the five days uh, and four nights. But she just, uh, she, she, she flew and, uh, you know, was very happy about that. Uh, Neeru Toprani came in 1977 and Apuricha came in 1975. And they've all been involved in, in many different ways in the cultural and social life of Oman while retaining distinctive Indian identity. Uh, and how is this uh, connection made? Well, in many different ways, through cultural, social interactions, uh, through informal engagement in social groups and travel that makes it possible for Indian Omani ties to flourish. Uh, these are all from the collection of Nena Purecha here and a trip, uh, different trips that they have taken to, um, to, go, to go to Kutch, uh, to investigate, to study, um, uh, knitting, quilting techniques, uh, traditional heritage uh, stitching techniques as well. And so this is uh, a group of people who've gone all the way there, as you can see, uh, to Gujarat, and also learned, actually, traditional crafts. And of course, there's so much shared history of all these uh, material culture in terms of clothing, embroidery. So there's a lot of exchange of ideas in these groups uh, as well. There are also social groups, and there's also volunteering, informal groups like the Musket Quilt Group, which shares a traditional knowledge from Oman and India to create artifacts which reflect the multiple cultures and also points to common histories of material heritage uh, as well. So these are uh, quilts, actually, uh, which were produced uh, for um, an occasion. Uh, 
There's also community engagement. So with one foot at home and one in the community outside, women at the end of the 20th century were actively exploring opportunities and pushing the boundaries of possibilities in the public sphere. Many were engaged in the various Indian social clubs that actually came up, retaining cultural practices and inventing new forms of belonging, given changes also in local conditions, such as like hosting the Rath Yatra, for example, within the temple itself, uh, or observing Holi, uh, which I think is also being done today, within private uh, spaces. So, so in the way in which we can negotiate, you know, Indians in Oman are negotiating their identity, their cultural practices, their, their heritage, uh, in ways that are in keeping with the laws of the land, and yet, uh, you know, using uh, their own personal um, um, uh, heritage and history. So we also have here Himrata Jasrani here singing a traditional song about flamingos, and there's a wonderful story about that, which I'll just explain in a minute, which are common to Kutch. So just before we play that, uh, so uh, flamingos are very, very, um, uh, very uh, popular in Kutch because they are migratory birds, uh, and uh, so they come in uh, in, the, in the winter months when it's very, very cold elsewhere, uh, and they make a home. Get it? You know the idea of home. Uh, so they make a home in Kutch temporarily. Apparently, uh, they, they leave eggs uh, at, the end, at the end of their stay there, go away, and then we have uh, you know, more, more flamingos uh, really coming up and so creating a new home for them. So this is uh, a beautiful sto uh, song that uh, Himlata Ben has recorded uh, for us. This is very short, but I do have other songs if we have uh, time. But yeah, this is uh, the story. And in fact, uh, the story actually celebrates Kachi generosity, hospitality, in that even flamingos are welcome, right? Like that's what the song is saying, that we also welcome even the flamingos who are guests because they're going to go back. But this is, you know, the Kachi um, uh, generosity. And the song reflects nostalgia for home, you know, remembering the flamingos, idealizing the land left behind, but also giving hope that new worlds are also possible. Yeah, please. Look, a song. कुंजी तो जा पचला यारे दफल में किस्मत आलनाई ते वला तन कुंजी अन्य के कुंजल के कड़ला ए सोई खा भी उतलाड़ी लाड़े वला तन कुंजी Thank you. So we'll just move ahead here, looking ahead. So the entrepreneurs. With the globalized world of the 21st century, women of the Kachmanvi families have reinvented themselves now in different ways. Many of these women were educated in Muscat, in fact, in the, in, either in the Indian or in the international schools here. They're professionals now, we're talking about now really, uh, in different fields like finance, technology, medicine. Many of them contribute to Oman in all kinds of uh, private and public, but mostly now public ways. Many are directors of family-owned companies, and they have been involved in diversifying their portfolios. Others have also set up their own ventures in related uh, fields. These include, of course, the Kimji Group of Companies, as well as uh, Murnal's Boutique uh, MB. So these are people who have used their family uh, original uh, businesses, but also diversified as well. All of them, of course, women. Jessel Asher, of course, of the Al Ansari Group is also making her mark in the company, leading from the front. So uh, we also have, of course, Shilva Pavani, who's a chartered accountant, member of the Pavani family, the historical Pavani family. She's been actively involved in the community by serving as a convener of the management committee of the Wadi Kabir School here. She's also actively involved with protecting her family's legacy and heritage. She's also been very, very supportive of this project to document uh, the community's oral history. We also have Dr. Hir uh, Hiral Jerajani, who's a descendant of the Gopalji Jerajani family, uh, who we saw in the, the temple uh, uh, announcement there, which first established the Motishwa temple in Muscat. She's now a successful medical practitioner, uh, running her own radiology uh, unit. Vaishale Jasrani is an accomplished cricketer, and she is, in fact, captain of the Omani national women's cricket team, thus bringing India and Oman together in a public sphere as well. So, to conclude, the Indo-Oman relationship is civilizational 
and there are connections at every level, as research shows. However, the perspective of women and their role in the history and contemporary life of Oman both uh, remains less explored. There are a lot of areas that need to be further explored for anyone who's interested. Some of those questions that we need to keep asking is, how can this history be documented further? How can more families be involved in these projects? How can the community become more involved in archiving its own history? And how can technology be leveraged to archive and document these histories? In fact, uh, I have uh, my colleague here, Haider Hassan, uh, and this is one example here. Uh, this is an Instagram uh, page and a platform called In Their Wake, a celebration of Indian communities in Oman. Uh, this is uh, his uh, platform, which is an attempt to document stories of Indian migrants. And it would be lovely to have a section of, uh, you know, historical um, the women, uh, women's stories, uh, historical Indian women, all of that. There's also a proposal the, uh, to create a rolling multimedia website to include oral memories, photographs, and other archival uh, material, which absolutely needs to be uh, documented. So in any case, uh, the story of uh, women uh, in Oman uh, is incomplete still. Uh, there's lots more stories out there. Uh, there are many more people whose voices we haven't heard. This is only the tip of the iceberg. This is only part of uh, the story. Uh, but they are uh, motivational, they are inspirational, uh, and uh, definitely deserve a uh, role in the history books. So thank you very much. And I am uh, so, so grateful to all the people who have uh, uh, spoken to me, taken time to speak to me, shared their uh, their material with me and told uh, their so personal stories to me. So thank you very much. Uh, up to you. It's fine with me. Thank you, Sandhya, for a wonderful gift on our Mani Women's Day to all these women present. Thank you. Um, wonderful to document you know, these lives and to, to save them you know, before they, they disappear. My question is, um, so you, you basically, your, your collection was based on lived lives, right? So my question is, among these women you know, who are still living, do you think that they have also um, um, stories that they have heard? I mean, really imagined story, not real stories. You know, you know my interest in storytelling. So have you collected any of their stories? Because there's another heritage out there mm -hmm. which also can be very telling, you know, about the fact and fable. You know, they could be imagined stories, but they can also be, you know, lives out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Munira. Yeah, um, it's, uh, there's, there are a lot of shared stories. There's a lot of myth and mythology in Indian communities which are shared. And, uh, uh, as I said, I mean, there's so much more to uncover, and uh, absolutely, uh, the, the literary part of it, oral stories, I mean, this is part of, like, personal oral stories, but yes, the more imaginative creation stories that were handed down to children, grandchildren, would be fascinating as well, so yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you for His Excellency, the Ambassador, and the Embassy, for this opportunity, and thank you... Professor, about the wonderful Naksha. And if we see about Oman in their relation, it's back maybe for 5,000 years, you know. And uh, your project seems on the woman in Muscat and Matrah. My question also, if you see the Indian community in, in the whole Gulf, especially in Sur, Sohar, Saham, Salala, so it's going to be the same. So I have my suggestion a little bit, you know. Uh, we have in Muscat the French Museum, for example. I went to Michigan. They have Arabs Museum in the Dearborn, in the Arab city. I think we need to have Indian Community Museum in Muscat. 
very historical, yeah, very historical. Matra? Okay, no problem, but we have to have one. Mascot, yeah, and matra. Mascot and matra. Okay, thank you for a wonderful lecture. We enjoy it. Thank you for the wonderful thank suggestion, you. Dr. Muhammad. Thank you. An excellent talk by you, please, and uh, especially celebrating the Women's Day today. What I would like to just make a comment was that the what you talk about the pioneers, the 200 years before uh, period, there was always a bar on the Hindu community traveling overseas. So technically, a lot of them were traders who traveled, mm -hmm. but they were forced by the society to leave their wives behind. So that they, that ensured those, those traders went out but came back again. And that is why the women would not have been settled in Muscat or Zanzibar or wherever. That was the reason why there was a lack of women in the, those areas. So it's only when the Hindu society changed in the early 1900s, late 1900s, uh, 20s and 30s, that the ladies were also allowed to come out. And that is where the ladies settled down here. Yeah. That is my understanding of it. Yeah. Thank you very much. In fact, I did ask uh, this question about the Kalapani to uh, many women. And because Kalapani is very much actually, uh, you know, the black waters, in for, if for those of you who didn't understand that, it's a very... Uh, uh, common kind of concept in Indian society and in fact uh, through if we talk about Bihar and the indentured labor that went to Fiji and uh, uh, you know uh, the Caribbean uh, that was actually very prominent but when I asked uh, women here uh, the, the ones who were already here of course said no well not really but in fact I think I remember Neeruji saying well we did have some superstitions in fact I, I didn't mention that here but they, but she did tell me that uh, anyone who traveled outside First of all, uh, I think uh, it was her son who couldn't uh, come until, you know, the first hairs fell off, you know, what in, what in India we say is a mundan. So until the first hairs uh, were cut off, uh, the child couldn't travel overseas. Uh, and, and also anyone who was traveling would be given a dry coconut uh, as an offering and they would have to carry this coconut with them until they reach the place, their final destination, and then they would kind of, you know, research and kind of thing, right? Like you would uh, kind of uh, place it in uh, a stream or some kind of water body. So I found that these were very, very interesting, um, if you like, you know, beliefs or superstitions. And you're absolutely right, of course, that there was uh, a hesitation. Uh, I mean, we know that from Gandhi himself also, right? That, uh, about going away, that is. Hi. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Hi. So I just wanted to wish you a very happy Women's Day as well. And thank you for coming and gracing our stage here. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a backstory about my family. So I came here as a 13 year old girl uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> So uh, from uh, West Africa, Liberia, where I was born and raised, my parents are Sindhi. And if you ask Dr. Muhammad sitting up here, who just suggested about the museum, he's going to tell you while you have a 5,000-year-old history with Gujaratis, you have a 7,000-year-old history with Sindhis. Mm -hmm. So um, in um, context of the Women's Day, I wanted to tell you that like Sultan Qaboos's mom had a very difficult marriage. As you can imagine, like they have to be politically correct, but but I knew some I know some very prominent uh, families in Salala, and they told me that she actually ran away on her wedding day, and she couldn't like she didn't want to go to the shadi, you know, to her wedding, so she ran away, and then she was forced to marry Sultan Kabus's father because he was from the royal family. 
in a similar analogy, my grandmother, that is my mother's mother, was forced to marry my grandfather, whose family was the princely family from Nawab Shah in uh, Pakistan, Sindh. You know, and Ajmer was not added into India in 1947. Ajmer was added much later. There is a college or a school in, um, there is a school in Ajmer called Mayo College, where the father of Sultan Kabu studied and where my parents were born and raised. You know, and in a crazy twist of fate, America decided in Disneyland to make a story of a woman called Jasmine, who comes from a place in South Asia, and India or Pakistan, they're not sure, but she's kind of Arabian. It's really my story. I'm married to an Omani since eight years, and I've been here, and I'm opening Princess Jasmine Museum in two months under the patronage of Sultan uh, Haytham's brother's wife, Saida Susan al Said. So I'd be happy to invite you and everybody here. And this story is about women who heal, women who get better and better from all the sufferings they endure and give birth to amazing leaders who in their children or in their grandchildren change the world. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Jasmine. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sandhya, for enlightening us with an historical account of the lives of diaspora women in Oman. Now, may I kindly invite His Excellency, the Amb His Excellency Ambassador Amit Naran and Divya Ma'am to the stage to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Sandhya. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Sandhya. As we draw towards the conclusion of our formalities, I request everyone to kindly join us for refreshments uh, towards the backside of the stage. Once again, I extend my heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you who joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank mm-hmm. you.